In the call to order, I would look uh, to the committee for any disclosures of pecuniary interest. Uh, I see uh, Councillor Park. Uh, to everyone in the gallery, if we could uh, start moving the meeting forward to just seek uh, some quiet, please. Thanks. Thank you. I declare an interest on item number 12 as my family owns a nearby property. Thank you, Councillor Park. Any further? Um, I'll uh, declare an interest with respect to the added, uh, which is number um, 13, uh, a letter requesting delegation status from uh, the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, my conflict uh, was with respect to he's my employer. Okay, um, as well, uh, Mr. Levin is here from uh, EPAC. Uh, he has a scheduled item for 4.30. Uh, he has a, a conflict a little bit further uh, along, so he was wondering if we might be able to move his uh, item forward uh, to, uh, uh, to the top of the meeting, if, uh, if I could seek a motion to make that motion. Uh, Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Park. All in favour? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Levin, uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee, for allowing me to jump ahead. Uh, I will be brief. I'm presenting the EPAC report, and I'd just like to direct your attention to uh, three items. Uh, item four on that agenda is uh, to let you know that tomorrow at Civic Works, our aquatic specialist will be bringing forward EPAC's recommendation on one River, which was we're supportive of the staff recommendation because we believe that the restoration of the dam would have an undesirable impact on fisheries, fish management, water quality, reptiles and their habitat, especially turtles, and specifically to the red horse sucker fish species and their habitat would be negatively impacted. So I just wanted to let you know uh, because we, we report to you and not to Civic Works, but to thank you for allowing us to be a delegate at that meeting. Number nine on your agenda is uh, for us an exciting visit from the Deputy Environmental uh, Commissioner for the province. She'll be coming on March the 15th at 5 p.m. Members of council are certainly invited to attend. She'll be speaking and giving us an overview of citizen tools offered by the Environmental Bill of Rights, an update on the province's species at risk protection regime, and an update on how the province is doing on protected areas goals. And finally, number 14, which deals with the uh, Medway Conservation Master Plan. We were asked by staff to have a recommendation uh, at our last meeting on December 21st but uh, not sure when the staff recommendation on this particular project is coming forward. So what we're asking for is simply that our recommendation is on your agenda when staff's recommendation is on the agenda. So whether this is a referral to that agenda or a deferral, I, I'm in your hands. And open to any questions on any other parts of the agenda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levin. I'll look to the committee. Uh, I see you. Is that Councillor Park? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levin, for that presentation. I think that I would like to move that number 14 be referred to a future meeting of uh, Planning Environment Committee when we deal with the Medway conservation. Uh, thank you, Councillor Park. Uh, just quickly, I might look to staff uh, for best way to, to stick handle that. Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, we would be in agreement with that. Um, we think that uh, that would be the right order of operation, that it comes forward at the same time as the conservation master plan will be providing a presentation and the results of the master plan will be in front of you and then you would have these comments as well. Thank you. I would look for a seconder to that, uh, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, Mr. Levin, is that to satisfy the, uh, the intent of what EPAC is looking for? Exactly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I imagine as well uh, that being referred over allows staff to have that in hand for uh, consideration as it makes its recommendations and uh, presentation as well. That's right. So uh, we'll make sure that uh, this is incorporated into the formulation of, of recommendations that can, uh, considered by the consultant as well as staff and others. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a motion on here. Is this, this is with the amendment? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Park and, uh, and seconded by uh, Councillor Hopkins. Um, if, uh, if I might, just uh, one quick question. Just on clarification, Mr. Levin, you'd stated uh, the Deputy Commissioner was coming uh, on what date at 5 p.m.? March the 15th, our March meeting, I believe the third Thursday is March the 15th. I see our committee secretary nodding, so I'm right. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any further discussion from the committee? Seeing none, moved and seconded. I'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries 6 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, looping back to the uh, consent items, so is anything uh, anyone wishes to pull from consents? Councillor Zapin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I don't need anything pulled per se, just if I could speak to a couple items uh, before it gets passed. Absolutely. Uh, Councillor Hopkins, did you wish something? Uh, just a question on eight? Okay. Uh, nothing to be pulled then? Uh, then I'll entertain. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just uh, here briefly to speak to items number two, or sorry, three, uh, four, and number five, which are all uh, new developments happening uh, in my ward. I uh, just wanted to be here as available to speak if needed to these applications. And uh, one of the things which I hear frequently from my constituents, especially in the Summerside community, is that we need more commercial development in the area. And uh, one thing which I frequently tell to people in that area is that with more development, with more people, come more commercial development. And so I think this is a positive sign for that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, number eight, really um, glad to see um, uh, these changes coming forward, and I'm pleased to see, hear that um, staff is generally supportive of the regulations, the proposed regulations on uh, the OMB reform, Bill 139. Uh, the one question I have, uh, just trying to understand the changes going forward and where the public comes to play in, in these changes. And I just would like staff's uh, response, I guess, just getting a better indication on where the public is in this process. Is it where the public is heard and how, how do, does it change or does it change? Uh, if I can have just a, a better understanding on that. Through the chair. Um, the real changes are that the public input is to be considered through the actions that you take. The changes that have been made put more reliance on the local decisions and, in fact, narrow what decisions you make can be appealed. So in the actual appeal, there would be less and less role of the public because the matters under appeal are very narrow and they're very much around procedural matters and whether or not your decision was in conformity with the provincial plan, provincial policy statement, those kinds of things. So, in fact, the thinking is there'll be less of a role in the actual hearings because the hearings will be more procedural on the validity of your decisions rather than hearing all about your decision all over again. Uh, if I can uh, just have a quick follow-up on that, too. Uh, so would the process still be the same if a uh, application has come forward, uh, the community did not support uh, the recommendation and wanted to appeal that? How Will that still can be um, followed in the same process? Or, like, I hear what you're saying, uh, so it's going to be important uh, obviously that we as a committee council hear the concerns of the public, but where is the public, um, again, does anything really change from the public's perception on appealing or uh, having more of a voice or not? Through the chair, there's no change on anybody's right to appeal. But what can be appealed is much narrower. So it's more important for the public to be involved in the process of the decision making that you make. When it comes to appealing a decision that's been made, 
what can be appealed is much narrower. They're not going to, in the same way, it, right now, the hearings are considered to be de novo. In other words, uh, it's, it's a brand new day when we go to a hearing. And what is considered is considered based on the evidence that the board receives. Under the new rules, those types of hearings would not occur in the first instance. The appeal that would be lodged by any appellant would be very narrow and would have to be on how did the decision you as a council make, how was that at odds with provincial policy statement or provincial plans? So their bar, anybody's bar to appeal is much higher. So that, that, that anybody can still appeal, but what can be appealed is much narrower. It's not the full scope of your decision, it's whether or not your decision was concurrent with overall provincial policy. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just add to that quickly. The, um, I've always been amazed that there are very specific and rigorous requirements around public participation in the planning process. And it gets through to council and all of that public input's there and you make a decision and then it goes to the Ontario Municipal Board. And the board, uh, up until these changes, would hear a, a hearing as though it's de novo, it's, it's a, a new hearing, and now the public's not there. And so that's the big win for the public, I think, in these new regulations, is now all of that input that goes into the local decision gains greater status, and there's more limitations around what could be appealed um, by way of the decision that you make as a council, as a democratically uh, elected um, council. So that's the big win for the public on the what whether the public can appeal or not, as Mr. Barrett said, uh, a lot of that, um, that, that public opportunity to appeal is still there. Uh, Councilor Park. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fleming actually said a lot of what I wanted to say, but I did have a question about the extension of the uh, statutory timelines, and I wondered if uh, staff had any indication what that may or may not do to the work plan. Well, I'll, I'll speak from planning services perspective and uh, certainly won't, won't speak on behalf of development services, but um, I, I think that we haven't really worked that through yet. Um, the uh, planning application piece, this could be helpful, but the big question becomes, do we not, despite this extension of uh, our approval time limits, do we still not want to move things ahead as quickly as possible and efficiently as possible? So. I'm not so sure it's going to have a large impact on the resources required to process planning applications. Mr. Yeoman. Uh, through the chair, I don't, uh, echoing what Mr. Fleming was uh, talking about, I, I don't think it'll have a huge amount of resource implications. However, what it could have an implication on is that the, um, the changes that have occurred have extended the amount of time for official plan amendments. However, the subdivision period review period has remained the same. So what it means for us in development services, we'll still be bringing forward our subdivision period um, and the official plan amendments together within that same 180 day window, not the additional window that we have. Thank you. And Councillor Zapin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My apologies. I had a question that I forgot before. Um, I guess actually more of a just a concern to share. Um, so this is regarding uh, number three, um, the Sifton. <clears throat> the Sifton subdivision off Commissioner's Road. I know that at a previous meeting, um, we dealt with, I believe, um, Oriel Drive connecting through to the, or as a connection between the two subdivisions to the west to Victoria on the Thames. Um, and I think that at that, that meeting, it was taken out uh, to protect the green space that can be seen in between the two subdivisions. Um, since that meeting, I've had quite a few concerns from people currently living in the Victoria on the Thames subdivision, stating that they're concerned they only have one exit to get out of their subdivision. And as it grows, it may be an ongoing and building concern. And so I wanted to make sure to flag that for both committee and for our staff today. Thank you, Councillor. Anything further from any members of the committee? Councillor Helen. Thank you. And uh, on item number eight, uh, I see the recommendation is for us to receive the report for information and certainly it's very helpful. Is it our intention to submit anything to the ministry in terms of feedback on the regulations that they have proposed before the deadline? Uh, through the chair, um, there wasn't really much in the regulation that we thought there was 
that we need to comment on because they seem to be generally consistent with the directions that we previously provided. But certainly with the direction of the committee, we could forward this report as uh, as information and we could submit it to the EBR for their consideration so they would see that the matters that this council had previously uh, raised issues about have been addressed in the regs. Thank you. I, I would like to make that small amendment uh, to eight. So I don't know if we need to pull that out, but I, I think that would be helpful. I think for the ministry to hear that we generally support where the regulations are going, I think would be helpful. I don't want the consultation to be just dominated by people who have issues with the regulations. Although I will say, I would have much preferred that they would allow the uh, changes around the official plans to include, for example, the London plan, but they have not. And thank you, Councillor Helmer. Actually, I was going to follow on that point that uh, uh, perhaps that is a recommendation that we did want to make. I, I think we've, we've stated it a few times to the ministry, but uh, we're, we're seeking the ability to have uh, the OP review uh, done as part of the LPAT process. Mr. Chair, I would just say that um, we took a crack at that. <laughs> and uh, when we knew this was coming down the pike and we were really trying to get the London plan hearings uh, under the new rules, but uh, the province was pretty clear with us all the way through that that wasn't something that was going to be doable. And um, I, I don't think it would be fruitful to pursue it further. Uh, fair enough. Um, uh, oh, sorry, Mr. Barrett. And, and if I may, um, the, the, the draft transition rules that are in force, in fact, won't come in until the regulations are actually put in, which would likely be, at this point, July 1. The province normally adopts regs on the 1st of January and the 1st of July. Uh, we will hopefully be well into the process at that point. So even if the transition rules that are drafted right now or ones that would even capture the London plan, we're already into the process. So I can't imagine that even new transition rules would take us out given the timing um, that, that they would actually come into force and effect. Fair enough, thank you. Um, I understand that uh, in order to make the amendment, we'll, we'll need to pull eight. Uh, so uh, any further discussion, I, I would put uh, look for somebody to put two through seven forward uh, for passage. Moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Park. Uh, further comment by Councillor Hopkins. Thank you for acknowledging me, because I think it is important that the public understand, too, the changes that are about to come forward. And I just want to, um, I guess, uh, clarify that all applications now received after the December the 20, uh, 12th will fall under the new bill. And I just want to get uh, staff's comments on that. Previous applications prior to December the 12th would fall under the... Uh, old OMB uh, regulations, is that correct? So prior to answering, what we'll do is we'll, we'll dispense with two through seven, and then we'll have to bring eight forward for a vote, so we'll, we'll have the opportunity to bring that there. All right, we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries. Six to zero. Thank you. And uh, with respect to uh, Councillor Hopkins' question on eight. Uh... Through the chair, it's, it's, it's not completely clear there's, because there's a little bit of mist and fog around it because, again, as I stated, these, these actual transition rules are not even in force and effect. They wouldn't come into force and effect until the regulations were, were published. So as it stands right now, there would be transition rules on two matters, appeals of non-decisions made after the bill comes into force, or appeals of non-decisions made before proclamation in respect to a complete application made after royal assent. So there's sort of two different little timelines. Royal assent has been given, and that's December 12th. So yes, for all intents and purposes, our mindset is that something that's received after then it's likely your consideration would be uh, around the same time as when these rules are coming into force and effect, but it's likely they would be under the new rules. It, it's, it's just that matter of timing and when these rules actually come in. But the, the draft regulations have acknowledged sort of two periods of time, proclamation and royal assent. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Uh, so we've got a motion on the floor to uh, forward these uh, these comments to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and House or Munici Municipal Affairs and the Ministry of the Attorney General for their information. It's been moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any further discussion on this? Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, we'll call the vote.
closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item nine with respect to the application by Future Streets uh, Inc. Uh, for the property at 1843 Frederick Crescent. Uh, we have a public participation meeting, so I will seek a motion to open the meeting. It's been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Park. We'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, the uh, subject site of the application is at 1843 Frederick Crescent. Uh, this is located in southeast London near Clark Road and Hamilton Road. Uh, it's on a local road and was created through a plan of subdivision. Um, the site is located at the end of the street uh, near a future road extension before it abuts in a property um, that has yet to develop. Here's an aerial view of the subject site. You can see it's at the end of the street in kind of triangle shaped abutting the, the property. So the application was to remove the existing holding provision on the site and allow for the development of a single detached dwelling. Uh, this holding provision read uh, to ensure that there's a consistent lotting pattern in this area. Uh, the H82 symbol shall not be deleted until the part block has been consolidated with the adjacent lands. Uh, so through this rezoning, the applicant has been able to demonstrate that a single detached dwelling can be accommodated on the existing lot without the need of any special provisions within the existing R13 zoning regulations. Um, this illustrates that the current lot configuration, though different in shape in the, in the rear yard, can function in the same manner as the rest of the subdivision, uh, helping to ensure compatibility and uh, continuity within the subdivision. Um, when the lands to the west develop, it is likely that a remnant parcel or sliver will be created uh, or an alternative road alignment will be established. If this sliver is created, the developer uh, may be required to merge the sliver with the subject site to ensure an appropriate lotting pattern is maintained in the area. Um, since the lot is functional under the current R13 zone and the holding provision is dependent on abutting lands proceeding with development, uh, staff feel it's appropriate to remove the holding provision at this stage and allow uh, the single family dwelling to develop and the lands to the west deal with the sliver in the future if it develops. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is the applicant here? And the applicant uh, called me today and didn't want to travel in the weather, but I did suggest he send an email. Um, he was in support of the application, um, if that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the public, any questions of a technical nature prior to going to the public? Seeing none from the committee, I will look to the public. Any comments or questions? Seeing no one here, I will ask one more time. Seeing none, I will take a motion to close the public participation meeting. It's been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Helmer. I'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Very good. Uh, any questions or discussions from the committee? Councillor Helmer. I just wanted to comment on the um, general form of the report. I know we're moving forward and changing how we're doing the reports for planning <clears throat> issues. And I, I did find this one, I know this is a relatively simple uh, rezoning and issue, but I did find the structure to actually work a lot better than what we have been dealing with in the past. I think it's really clear. Um, I know we had an example in the past, but I, I think this is one of the first ones that's in front of us um, for sort of our review as in a decision. And I did want to say to our staff that I think it's on the right track. Thank you, Councillor Helmer. Any further comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Staff recommendation moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Park. Any further debate? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Thank you. And moving on to item 10. Uh, this is a public participation meeting with respect to an application by the London Language Institute property located at 653 Talbot Street. Uh, I will seek a motion to open a public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Park. I'll call the question.
closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Thank you, and with the public participation meeting now open, I turn to you, Ms. Wise. Uh, thank you and good evening. Uh, the application of Z8808 is at 653 Talbot Street. Uh, this site is within central London and is located just uh, to the northwest of the downtown. Uh, it's also located um, just east of the Thames Valley um, corridor. Uh, the site itself has a frontage of 25 meters and a lot area of 2,250 square meters. Uh, it's located on the west side of Talbot Street, uh, just across from John Street. Um, and to the west there is the Thames Valley, uh, as well as the um, Thames Valley uh, Parkway uh, multi-use path. Uh, to the north of the site, there's the Locust Mount site, um, which has previously been approved by council for a 16-story high-density residential um, apartment use. And then towards the south uh, and east, there's a mix of low, medium, and high-density residential uses um, with existing heritage properties, uh, as well as some office conversions. Uh, the site itself is occupied by a two and a half to three story uh, red brick dwelling. It was constructed in 1908 in the Georgian Revival style uh, known as the Cuddy property. Uh, the garage is not um, original to the dwelling. Uh, it was added afterwards, but the exact date is unknown. Uh, it's currently listed as a priority one property on the inventory of heritage res resources. Uh, it's also located within the future potential Talbot Heritage Conservation District. Um, there's also uh, uh, an existing brick wall of uh, importance, and there's an existing um, vehicular access to the uh, north of the site. The proposed development is for uh, an adaptive reuse to permit the private school, um, the London Language Institute, and a daycare facility within the existing um, dwelling footprint. Uh, some small changes are um, proposed one of which is to modify the garage located at the north of the property to allow vehicles to access through um, to the new parking area provided at the rear. There's also a three-story um, addition proposed at the southwest corner of the site. Um, originally, it was uh, much smaller just to um, encompass an existing stairwell, but it has since been uh, enlarged to provide more functional space, including classrooms. Uh, the addition also maintains the existing building line on the southern boundary. And there's also a new vehicle access proposed at the southeast corner of the site, uh, which will facilitate this drop-off and pickup area and provide a second access. Uh, so the wall that was um, out front will shrink in size. Um, both uh, accesses will have the um, pillars widened, but it is proposed to be maintained uh, otherwise. Um, in terms of the uh, east elevation, so this is the garage, um, this is the front elevation. So that will be uh, removed at the bottom, but maintained on the top. Um, so it'll have a drive through. Uh, the north elevation shown here shows the height of the proposed addition. Uh, so it's a three-story addition, but it isn't um, higher than the existing built form. So it wouldn't be seen from the street. Um, and again, this shows a smaller um, original addition. It is much larger now, uh, but the height is still the same. Um, similar with the west, so this is the rear. Um, this is again showing the drive-through that will eventually access the rear yard. Um, the height of the proposed addition, and same with the south. Uh, looking at our policy context, it's consistent with the provincial policy statement as it promotes a range and mix of local employment and institutional uses. It efficiently utilizes the existing services and infrastructure uh, within a settlement area and encourages a sense of place by conserving the built heritage features that help define character. With regards to the official plan, it's within a special policy area, the Talbot Mixed Use Special Policy Area. This area anticipates requests for the conversion and redevelopment of lands, and also permits a broader range of uses, including office conversions, retail, personal service, restaurant, and business service uses, though doesn't specifically identify private school or daycare as uh, permitted uses. The site's also within the multifamily high-density residential designation. Uh, primary permissions are for a wide range of um, residential uses and intensities. And secondary permitted uses, such as community facilities, um, are contemplated within all of the residential designations. 
Considerations for community facilities and residential designations based on the residential amenity and neighborhood character, as well as the compatibility with the surrounding area. Uh, given that this is an adaptive reuse and maintaining the existing form, uh, it's considered to be sensitive to the scale and appearance of the surrounding area. Uh, the function of the site, if there's sufficient parking, pickup drop-off area, and access points. Um, there is a reduction of parking sought through this um, rezoning through a special provision um, from 18 spaces to eight, um, but it is considered sufficient with the um, additional provisions. Um, and site plan approval will also be required for this type of use. Um, so that considers parking location, um, landscaping, access, and maneuverability. Uh, with regards to Lennon plan, this site is within, or sorry, uh, community facilities are contemplated within the neighborhood place type um, and along a neighborhood connector, which is Talbot Street in this case. Uh, the site is also within the high density residential overlay. Uh, so this retains greater development potential uh, for sites not located within one of the new targeted growth locations. And development that conforms with the underlying place type, in this case, neighborhoods, uh, shall be encouraged. Uh, the zoning amendment is to the neighborhood facility. Uh, this zone will allow for the elementary, or sorry, the private school use and daycare facility. And special provisions will recognize the existing deficient setbacks and frontage of the existing property, uh, as well as a reduction in parking spaces. Some of the key considerations, um, the open space, the rear west portion of the site abuts the Ann Street Park and the Thames River Valley Corridor. A uh, portion of the lands will be required through parkland dedication, so not a cash only payment, and proposed to be zoned open space OS4 to be added to the adjacent lands. In terms of heritage, the site is currently a priority one listed property. Uh, Lash considered the proposal in September of uh, last year and were supportive of the application. They provided direction to um, provide a stage one and two archeological assessment to address the potential significance, uh, to have the property designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, and in the staff recommendation, there is direction to um, have civic administration uh, go back and prepare a statement of cultural heritage value or interest uh, to consider future uh, heritage designation. And that the existing windows along Delbert Street to be restored and repaired rather than be replaced. Uh, with regards to parking, there's a reduction from 18 spaces uh, required to eight provided for all uses on site. It's, it's uh, considered to be appropriate in this location given the highly walkable and bikeable uh, nature of the site. Um, the bicycle parking has actually been required um, as a higher minimum, so that would offset the vehicle spaces uh, not provided and take advantage of the very close uh, multi-use path. The recommendation is to maintain the existing R31, residential R31, um, with, an, with an additional special provision uh, to allow for the two driveways proposed through this uh, to be carried forward if the residential uses eventuate. Uh, the neighborhood facility one will allow for the private school and daycare facility as well as the elementary school um, and other community facility uses. Special provisions allow for a reduction in parking spaces to eight, a reduction in the frontage of 25 meters, a reduced north interior side yard as existing, which is at 0 0.2 meters, and a reduced south interior side yard at two meters as well. Uh, the bicycle parking has um, an increased minimum from two required to now 18. And the open space four um, is towards the west of the property, and that will be added to the um, Thames River uh, corridor. Um, as a summary, the proposal is considered to be consistent with the provincial policy statement, the current official plan, and the London plan, and provides an appropriate adaptive reuse of the existing heritage property, uh, as well as providing complementary uses to the existing surrounding neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Now I'll look to the committee for any technical questions. Councilor Helmer. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to our staff, um, the Access point, there's a double access and the one access that's further to the south, it looks like it comes out right at the intersection with John. And I just wonder if our transportation staff have any comments about that loop that's coming in there. I see in the report that there's basically no concerns, but I wondered about that. Through you, Mr. Chair, we, we haven't looked at the access details. We are waiting to, uh, to look in, in this uh, through the site plan process. That's when we look in more details uh, on the access arrangements. Uh, Thank you. Uh, anything further? Councillor Hopkins. 
Uh, thank you. Just to follow up on the access, on, uh, so tonight we are approving uh, the the two accesses onto uh, the street, and our um, I understand it's going to go through the site plan process. But uh, what is going to be happening with part of that wall as well? Do we know if it's going to be removed or not, or is that part of the site plan process? I just want to have a better understanding since we are approving the two accesses here tonight. What is going to happen to a part of that wall, or is it interfering in any way? This was. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the wall will be modified. Um, it'll be, um, the pillars will be, um, sorry, widened to accommodate the additional width. Um, the rest of the wall and the um, pergola in the middle uh, is proposed to be retained, though. Thank you. Any further technical questions? Uh, is there anyone here from the applicant to speak? Stormbush. Welcome. Good evening. Happy New Year. Um, my name is Michelle Dornbush. I'm with Selin Capriamo. Um, we are the uh, agents acting on behalf of the current property owners, um, the uh, London Language Institute. Uh, Justin Wismer from the Lon London Language Institute is also here. Uh, if there's any questions uh, for him with respect to uh, this application as well. We've had an opportunity to review the report. Uh, we have no concerns with respect to the proposed zoning and the zoning bylaw that's been brought forward by staff. Um, we do want to point out though that we do have some concern with regards to the heritage designation on the property. Um, typically what we find is the heritage designation is brought forward for sites where a demolition permit has been uh, applied for. In this instance, we're not proposing to tear down the building. We're maintaining the uh, front of the building um, as it sits today, uh, recognizing that the windows do need to be replaced. They're in poor condition and uh, the owner has undertaken to, or will undertake to replace them uh, with newer uh, windows, but mimicking the uh, look of those so you're maintaining uh, the views of the, of the building from the street. So uh, from that perspective, it is our position that um, it's best if the windows are replaced and not repaired. Uh, again, this uh, relates to energy efficiency um, and also for safety purposes in terms of actually being able to use the windows for uh, fire exits, things like that. So um, going back to the heritage designation, so this is a, a sort of a different circumstance that we've run into, which we've not come across in the past. Typically, the, the designation is tied to a demolition request, and again, that's not what is before you. Um, our clients do have a uh, very significant uh, tight timeline that they're working towards. Obviously, because this is a private school, they work uh, on a semester basis. Uh, the opening of this is supposed to be January of 2019. Obviously, if there's a delay with any of the applications, um, there's going to be a delay in an entire semester period. So it, it does result in a significant um, pushback in terms of the timeframes. So, uh, and again, with the designation, our concern um, is that it adds uh, an additional timeframes to the process. Uh, it requires a heritage alteration permit that would require to go through Latch, uh, Planning Committee, and to Council. Um, so it's our view that the, the heritage designation is not necessary at this time. If anything does change with the building, uh, it would be subject to additional approvals, uh, which uh, staff and council would have the opportunity to review at that time. And again, we're maintaining the residential look of the building. All the commercial activity is located to the rear of the property. Um, the brick wall uh, was suggested it is being maintained. Um, there is no... Uh, uh, proposal to tear it down. There has to be some modifications to it, obviously, to widen the entrances to accommodate uh, safe traffic flow. But outside of that, um, the wall, and we've made that clear from the beginning, is proposed to be maintained. Although with the road widening that's required along Talbot Street, it will be located uh, in the road allowance. So we do understand that there will have to be an encroachment agreement for that, um, which obviously we, we have no concerns with. So from that perspective, again, it's our position that the 
that there is no need to designate this building at this time. We are not proposing any significant changes. However, if the committee is still of the opinion that it needs to be designated, we would ask that the designation be brought in after the changes so that we can ensure that the work can commence uh, and the building can be converted and then the designation come after so they can ensure that they meet their time frames uh, for the opening for uh, January of next year. So that's our biggest concern with, re with respect to it. Our client doesn't have, um, Obviously, he's concerned about the time frames and, and making sure that we can uh, accommodate them and the ad added process of the designation uh, is a concern. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Uh, any questions of the applicant of a technical nature from the committee at this time? None seen. Uh, I'll go to the audience. Uh, is there any member of the community wishing to speak on this application? All right. Seeing none, uh, I'll call one more time. Final call, I'll take a motion to close the public participation meeting. Moved by Mayor Brown, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. We'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Thank you, I'll look to the committee for questions and comments, uh, Councillor Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to speak in support of the staff recommendation on this. So I think that the design that we've seen here is not only very complementary to the existing structure itself, but very complementary to the rhythm of the existing street. Um, I think that it's a good integration of use and reuse of this property. Um, regarding some commentary about um, going forward with a designation, that's my understanding. We're not doing that today. We're giving staff the direction to come up with a heritage impact statement or a cultural significant statement. And also, when we do have a designated property, there's still a process to amend said property through the provision of a heritage alteration permit. So with a design as thoughtful as this, I would not see any sort of issue with um, an applicant coming forward with a heritage alteration permit and get, being quite successful in that, recognizing that it is the delegated authority that council has given on to staff. So again, very supportive of this application. I think it's a very good adaptive reuse of the site. Thank you. Uh, further questions, comments? Uh, seeing none, I might, uh, if I might, um, through staff, uh, what uh, would be the impact and, and associated timelines uh, associated with the uh, uh, statement of uh, uh, cultural uh, heritage value and uh, and any uh, intent to designate? Well, Mr. Chair, I just uh, turned back, spoke with Mr. Yanchula to confirm, but uh, I don't think there would be any. I think that the approach that we would use is, as uh, Councillor Park pointed out, this is a thoughtful design that's being proposed. Um, in terms of the actual designation, we will work to craft that designation so that it incorporates uh, this design. And uh, probably um, when you look at the timelines associated with designation um, and even getting those uh, reasons out there, we don't need to move forward um, exceedingly quickly with that. We can coordinate it so that uh, we can move forward with the site plan process, designation will follow. What I think everyone needs to recognize is that uh, we're adding a commercial school use here. Um, oftentimes in this kind of situation, we would add the use with, um, and it would say within the existing building. We didn't do that here because in fact, they're removing a portion of the existing building. And so the heritage designation ensures that the building itself, as is contemplated in this proposal, will remain uh, longer term. When priority, this is important, I think when priority one buildings come forward to the committee, it's an opportunity for you to move from listed to designated status. So uh, our intention is to move the process along quickly, but at the same time protect the heritage resource long term. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Mayor Brown. Not a question because my voice won't go up at the end, but I just, I wanted to say I'm, I'm very supportive of, of this application and, and I want to, um, acknowledge the London Language Institute uh, and the work that they do in this community. We're an education city, there's no doubt about that. Uh, when we look at uh, the kind of growth that we're going to see in education, it will be certainly uh, through international education. And so often at this community, we wrestle with the issue of a building that is um, a really important part of our heritage that doesn't have a new use. And this is uh, a great repurposing of, of this building. Uh, it's going to regenerate. 
the building, and uh, I, I can't think of a better better use. So I, I want to uh, thank the proponent for bringing this forward and uh, uh, continue to enjoy watching you grow here in London. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, I will now entertain a motion. Staff recommendation has been put forward, moved by Councillor Park Sound, seconded by Councillor Helmer. I'll take a vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Thank you very much. And I think we move on to uh, item 11, which is the first report of the Advisory Committee on Heritage. Mr. Yanchula. I'm sorry, I was distracted. What was the question? Sorry, I wasn't sure if uh, you wanted to speak to the uh, the first report of Latch. It's an item for direction uh, in here. It's uh, it's asking us with respect to a um, designation application under Section 42 for uh, 912 Queen's Ave. So, um, the I have nothing to say except that staff supports the heritage alteration permit with the conditions, terms and conditions attached there. It's uh, actually uh, infill project. Uh, you have, in or, when you're in a heritage conservation district, you may recall that when you alter the heritage conservation district, even if that means putting up an entirely new building, which this is, um, it requires a heritage alteration permit. Uh, we've met with the applicant on a few occasions. We're able to uh, bring this in compliance with Heritage Conservation District guidelines. So um, if nothing further to add, then it follows the process. Okay, thank you. And also we have a uh, notice be given uh, recommendation on uh, the Heritage Act on, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, one, sorry, uh, 163 Oxford Street East. And I understand that uh, the um, statement of cultural heritage, uh, as it indicated as attached, uh, was not attached. So the copies are just being made for distribution as committee. So we'll hold one second there uh, prior to moving forward with it so that the committee has a chance to have it in hand. In the meantime, uh, perhaps we can uh, move over to uh, item number 12. And uh, do I need a motion to to move past 11 while we wait for? Okay, we'll we'll deal with 12 right now, and, uh, and then we'll loop back to 11. Uh, so number 12, uh, with respect to staff report and notice to intent to designate 440 uh, Gray Street. Uh, Council Helmer. Uh, I'll move the recommendation. Yeah. Uh, staff recommendations on the floor has been moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. I'll call a vote on that. Uh, any discussion or questions? Seeing none. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Great. Uh, and uh, if I could ask uh, Councillor Hopkins to take the chair on 13 with my recusal. Okay, committee uh, number 13, we have a delegation request here from uh, Mr. Mackey from Middlesex London Health Unit asking for a delegation status as um, at the January 22nd meeting and to give the committee an update and also to uh, provide results of the public participation meeting. So I'd like to go to the committee for uh, any questions. Councillor Park. Thank you, Acting Chair. I'm happy to move the uh, motion to have a 
delegation from Dr. Mackey in the future. Um, I also wonder if I could put a question to staff at this time to ask if they could perhaps provide a brief companion report along with, so council has a good clear idea of, as to the work that's been done to date on this. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I couldn't do it on that date because I'm gonna bring you the whole report um, with a recommendation. So. Uh, that's what we're trying to coordinate here is to have Dr. Mackey here to speak to it from a planning perspective and we're trying to be very sensitive to that that this is not uh, CAPS, this is um, planning, but to have that context of hearing from um, the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health is I think very helpful in providing the context you need to make the decision on the report that we'll be bringing forward. I just wanted to say that I'm very pleased to hear that. I know that we kind of got off to a rocky start there, and I'm glad to hear that things have come together so quickly. Thank you to staff. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, I'd like to, um, I guess, move uh, the delegation request. Or, and moved by Councillor Park, seconded by Councillor Helmer. We'll go to the vote. Closing the vote, the motion no. carries five with one recused. <laughs> okay, on that note, I'd like to ask the chair back to his seat. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, Ms. Saunders has arrived with uh, our report. Give the committee a minute or two to take this in, and then uh, we'll entertain a motion with respect to this. All right, I'll look to the committee. Uh, if uh, we've looped back to uh, number 11, uh, any questions for staff regarding the 11th report of Latch, or first report of Latch? Seeing none, I will take a motion from the committee. Uh, moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries six to zero. Okay, and with that, uh, I don't see anything else on the agenda, so I think we'll move for adjournment. Moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All in favor? We're adjourned.